Hello everyone. So I am Angela Booth and I'm part of the Open Access Australasia Committee tasked with organising this year's Open Access Week events. So I'd like to welcome you all to the session today, Open Across the Research Spectrum, What Different Disciplines Can Learn From Each Other. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal Nation that I am on today. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the Elders past, present and emerging and extend this acknowledgement and respects to all First Nations people here today, wherever, wherever you are located. Um, feel free to pop in the chat um, any acknowledgements you wish to share from where you are today. I'm pleased to introduce our panel for the session. Um, today we have Dr. Jason Chin, Dr. Mayan Lai Ong, Dr. Anne Hardy and Gianni De Gravio, along with Dr. Thomas Shafi facilitating the session. Uh, now Mayan Lai Ong might be a little bit late, but um, we'll welcome him as soon as he attends. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the session will be recorded and it'll be made available on the OA Australasia website. Um, and we'll pop that link into the chat soon. Um, and if everyone could please keep your microphone muted and cameras off unless you are speaking. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat um, and we'll respond to them at the end. So with that, I'll hand over to Thomas and um, enjoy the session, everyone. Hi, and thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Welcome everyone to the session. Um, so what I'm hoping people are going to get out of this discussion today is um, an appreciation for the diversity of possible ways to engage with open access ideas. Um, so yes, to that end, we've got a, a great panel from some very different research um, and, uh, and open areas. Um, so firstly, Jason Chin works at the interface between science and law. Um, looking at how to ac uh, how access to to research impacts policymakers um, when they're making laws, as well as the justice system in implementing those laws. Uh, Mian Lee, if he's able to join us, um, will um, talk about uh, his work as a medical child psychologist, um, uh, in particular in getting psychology information to the people who need it from practicing clinicians through to mental health support workers, as well as those um, actively uh, affected by psychological illness. Um, and Gianni Di Gravio is both a, a university archivist and also chair of the Hunter Living Histories. And he's done wide ranging work using uh, new technologies to make archival material, uh, of course, much of which, which uh, consists of physical objects um, more accessible to global audiences. Um, and Anne Hardy is also uh, involved in uh, Hunter Living Histories, um, as well as coordinating the, the Glamex Lab at University of Newcastle. Um, she's been integral to getting students uh, involved in uh, particularly using experimental methods to make cultural heritage collections more available. Um, and this is useful, like both from the point of view of making that material more available, but also uh, giving new skills to the students that are involved. So yes, welcome everybody. Um, and so I, I, my, my first topic that I want to bring up is it's, it's easy to focus solely on open access as it relates to journal articles and journal publications. And of course, you know, there's a certainly an important part of the process, uh, but I want to ask the, the panelists, um, what sorts, uh, what, what are the sorts of items and uh, both kind of digital publication items as well as physical items that you think have been interesting um, uh, to have more openly available as part of your work? Um, and I guess I'll throw that to, to Gianni um, first of all, but I'm sure everyone has um, items to contribute. Everything. Everything. Um, that you think is important for people to know about. I mean, the important thing um, uh, for our, from my class, from my perspective, is um, what the community needs, you know, uh, this, what the community needs in terms of information. Um, what do you mean by community in, in that well, sense? Well, the communities that we serve. I mean, for us at the university, um, our act uh, specifies that we're here to serve the Central Coast and Hunter Regional communities. Um, but we also, you know, in a digital world, we deal with the global community as well. 
Um, but within that, you've got, you know, people, for instance, um, from the point of view of, of Aboriginal people, we, we I've, I've been to many parent teacher nights where the teachers at, on the other side have said to me, oh, we don't know very much about the local Aboriginal world um, or its history. And so from the archivist perspective, you try to find out ways of being able to fix that, that hole in, in the public knowledge. And so you start looking at not just the journal articles that have been published um, with regards to Aboriginal um, history and culture, but anything that you can get your hands on um, that comes from accounts, uh, survey accounts, um, uh, even things that have been you know, documented oral histories or whatever you can. You do that in collaboration with those people, primarily, um, even the donors and the creators of the material, um, because the archivists, I guess, in a way, have to have a personal relationship with the donors of this material, the creators. So that's a way of us sort of not having to worry too much about copyright. So generally, when you're dealing with older out of public domain, you know, in the public domain, that's fine. But when you're dealing with more recent things, if you've got a direct relationship with the creators of this material or the knowledge holders of this material and they want that material public, then that's the sort of best thing to do. But as far as I'm concerned, I just see the whole of human expression across eons of time and experience as one gigantic um, mind. You know, it's a hive mind. The more we can get away from this nonsense about sort of hiving off little bits and pieces over here behind paywalls, and to me, that's all just irrelevant. I mean, in terms of making sure that information survives into the long term, we have to share it. We have to share a lot of it now, especially now when the type of things we're putting our expression into are so fraught with problems of longevity. How long is this stuff going to last for? Um, so anyway, yeah, that's my two bits. And Anne, seeing as you, you've worked in a similar area, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on the, on the topic. Yeah, look, um, along similar lines to Johnny, I guess um, all forms of human expression and what we deal with um, at the University Library, special collections um, come in multiple formats. Um, from the physical item, we've got a coconut that was sent as a postcard from New Guinea um, in World War II. So, you know, it's quite a unique physical item to the audiovisual material that's part of the local television um, Newcastle that is, um, commemorates 60 years next year. So that's a specific sort of um, format. And, and I guess, um, you know, going back to like primary sources that um, often we sort of focus on the secondary sources and articles to, um, you know, build knowledge and, and share knowledge but, you know, I've seen so many students work on projects and it's sort of like the light bulb goes on when they start working with primary sources and physical items that, you know, the, the sort of the meaning they can get by um, looking at something and understanding like the creator behind it, I think is just a different experience again for students. So, you know, that focus on, on um, primary sources as an open access and, um, students being able to discover, and, and even we don't know what's in, you know, these, these um, large collections and, and archives that, you know, they may be accession, but it really is, um, they're waiting for someone to come and find different items. So, you know, I think the audio material, I think of that as a, as a great resource to reference. And, you know, this television archive that we've got, um, the next phase is to really try to understand the content how we can create metadata, but, you know, for students to access that, to learn um, from it and reference it as well. So, you know, to, to reference quotes and, um, and content that was sort of generated and created decades ago that isn't a historical sort of item in itself, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think to think sort of a little bit more diversity in terms of um, physical items and, and what's there. <coughs> for a, a whole array of different disciplines um, when it comes to archives. Uh, and so, I mean, Jason, I, I guess you're going to have a sort of a very different um, perspective on this because I'm, I'm guessing that the actual physical items are typically less relevant um, 
from from your perspective or yeah am i wrong oh well maybe i think the physical stuff is probably like like, like physical evidence and, and maintaining that um it's not something that i have thought about very much but there is um someone at uts named uh, kathy viber who's done some research on that uh, but what, what for me what what came to mind was um access to legal materials like uh, legal decisions, like the uh, judgments provided by judges, as well as the transcripts of a case. So you know, here, in a, here in a common law system, the judge's decisions uh, along with the statute are the law that we're, that we're meant to be um, following, and, uh, that we're governed by. So um, it's problematic when historically, you know, like now we have great systems like Aust Ostley, and um, Canley and uh, various iterations in different countries, but you know, historically it's been hard to get your hands on these uh, decisions, which is which is really problematic. And even now, you know, there's it's historically been um, published by things called law reporters, which will format it in their own way. So it's really hard to tell who's referring to what part of a judgment. And even now, with those still being more more freely available, which is great. It's a problem of it's very expensive to get to your hands on um, the actual trial transcript. I mean, in, in some cases, there's reasons why those would want to be anonymous. Although, you know, if, if the trial is open to the public, arguably the transcript should be as well. And you know, judges will give little decisions during the trial, and the facts those trials are relevant to our current you know liabilities and rights. So. Um, the fact that they cost like thousands of dollars in some cases to get is a, it's a problem. And also at, at the other end, I'm interested in um, material. So this is kind of talking about, for example, those um, those legal decisions and the dissemination of that information. And similarly, the, the archival materials and the sharing of that. Um, I'm interested in the, the earlier stages of that as material um, it either enters the archive and what the decision-making process is around, around that, and also in the making of legal decisions and how that is based on access to information. I mean, for example, I'm, I'm used to being in a university system. So when it comes to a subscription journal, I almost don't think about it. I'm logged in through my university's VPN and I can get access to it. Um, do, do, does every lawmaker typically have access to, um, to the publications and journals that they'd need to, to kind of make evidence-based policy? Uh, it, I think it depends. There have been some like systematic uh, studies of this. There's one by um, someone at Griffith named Zoe Rathis, who did some round tables and interviews and, uh, with folks in the family law system. And uh, she found pretty consistently that the, the judges and the practitioners all were struggle to get access to the social scientific material that they would want to get access to. Uh, and I'm the hugest proponent of um, open access, of course. Uh, but then there are all these, these kind of interesting things that happen when um, certain things can be accessed by the judge and they start quoting them in decisions, which in some ways isn't proper because in some decisions, some, some decisions have been overturned because the judge has improperly taken notice of some social scientific research that the other the parties haven't had the chance to make. Uh, submissions about, but yeah, but but generally, there's a, a serious problem where practitioners can't access the the research that they that they um, should be able to access. And so, what's the kind of the view from from the archivist direction in terms of um, materials moving into those archives? Oh, sorry, Johnny, I think you're um, you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, look, this is a pretty difficult question sometimes because, um, uh, well, look, with regards to legal rulings and things, I mean, to me, that's something that goes through a process by which people should have access to it. I mean, um, the process of getting access to archives sometimes is very precarious because a lot of the material that we get is usually disregarded. No one cares about it at the time. You know, a lot of things that we have now that researchers are thriving and loving, the researchers of 30 years ago had no interest in, you know. For instance, some um, children's homes records that were saved 
in the 1980s. At that time, no one cared much about the children's homes records. And, um, but given the Royal Commission's institutional child abuse, those records have now been crucial, uh, not just to the survivors, but people bringing perpetrators uh, to justice. Um, but a lot of the time, these things are saved basically because, you know, someone's usually instructed to go to the dump and um, something in them um, causes them to take the left turn and put it in their garage. And there it sits for 30 years before they find a, you know, um, a, a compassionate uh, archivist and institution that takes these things on. Um, given the pressures that universities are under now and all institutions are under uh, with government funding, space becomes a premium and these sorts of wonderful, you know, relationships that can be built between donors and savers becomes a, a lot more difficult to do, you know. But generally there's something in you um, that, you know, when, when you when you've got that box of material, there's something in you that says this thing has to be looked after. Whether it's done in my lifetime or not, it has to be kept for future generations because it's going to be important someday. Because inside those records, are, are the physical, um, physical evidence of how people's lives um, were led, you know, it might be pretty, it might be ugly, um, but we need them in terms of that um, initial, this is what historians need in order to be able to um, write their histories. Uh, they need these evidential records uh, to be able to prove that things happened. Um, but it's, look, every generation that comes through thinks it's better than every other generation that went. We're currently in that now. We think we know everything. And everyone in the past either had it wrong or they were, you know, they were, I don't know, in some other paradigm we see it all the time and the the, the biggest if the biggest difficulty is trying to take a step back and say look whatever however wonderful we think we've got it solved now the next generations coming in front of us are going to think we're a bunch of bozos okay and that we were clueless as well so we must always remember that everything that we do is always just a progression towards hopefully some kind of enlightenment. And these things that we let leave behind, these records, these physical records, I mean, when we talk a lot about digital, um, I love digital as a communication device, but it's there to help us look after the physical world we live in, you know, and to make sure that that physical world is transferred in some wonderful way to our next generations. That's basically what we do, what we do. And um, if there's something that has to be learned, if there's something that has to be, lessons that have to be drawn, um, monsters that need to be recognized, then that's where we're gonna find them. We're gonna find them in these, in these records. Um, I hope that makes sense. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, it does actually. I wanted to, to, ask, to ask Anne as well, because, mm -hmm. Um, like, do you think that there are specific resources that are that are often overlooked by researchers, or even you know not considered as academic sources that might still be valuable in this? Yeah, look, um, definitely, and I think what comes to mind are a lot of health and mental health welfare records that you know because of the the privacy and the um, sensitivity around it. Um, that, you know, there, there's sort of records that do identify people um, from the from the 1800s that often, you know, for a lot of these individuals, they were admitted to, like, the um, colonies asylums, as they were named at the time. Um, so, we've got, you know, we have um, descendants out there now that are sort of searching for family members that may not realise that, um, you know, their loved one was admitted to an institution. So there's sort of... Um, a lot of records out there that probably um, people don't focus on initially because of confidentiality and sensitivities around it. But oh, I know in New South Wales, sort of anything that's sort of outside that 110-year period that, you know, there, there's really a, a lot of um, records and case, um, case notes and, you know, that can tell us a lot about these individuals who, you know, I guess they, they do deserve to have a voice as well because, you know, they were sort of part of, um, part of society at a time when there wasn't a lot of social support and um, many of them didn't have families. So, 
I just think there's um, there's health records and so it's interesting talking about the legal records that I know a lot of the colonial um, legal papers and um, Aboriginal records have been digitised and available online. So I think a lot of that sensitivity diminishes over time, but it's sometimes easier to get the really early records than access um, the, yeah, the more recent ones. But, yeah, definitely those diverse um, people that sort of sat on the fringe of society and, um, you know, John has mentioned the children's home Home records, but you know, similar records that um, can sort of inform and tell us a lot of people from you know a couple of centuries ago. And so, interesting from from that point of view of um, kind of unexpectedly uh, useful materials, because I think one of the one of the things that comes up. Um, when we're talking about making knowledge more available um, is that sometimes it's very speculative. You know, we're, we're often making things available before knowing exactly who wants to see these, who wants to use these, who wants to adapt these. Um, uh, and so, Jason, I'm wondering from, from your experience, how do people decide um, what material should be made available? Because, you know, some of it can to an it, you know on first glance seems so specialized that outside of a, a really narrow area who would possibly care about it are you talking about about legal researchers in this yeah i guess I'm yeah the, the, the legal research in, in um in this case um i'm not quite sure what goes into that I, so i mean there are the two challenges with it for sure so I've been doing a, I did a study, I'm just finishing a study where we went, went through 300 uh, law journal articles that um, uh, use data in some way, some sort of systematic data collection. And, you know, most of the time, maybe like 80 to 85% of the time, there was just no mention about any effort they took to share the data. It was just that, you know, we got, you know, a hundred different contracts and we analyzed them here's the results and no, you know, it would be nice to see, oh, we, we, we thought about sharing them, but we didn't think it was proper for these reasons. Um, then there were some that were just incredible. So some, some, when I was just looking at, got a bunch of historic records, I think like treaties uh, and, and, and uh, digitized them and put them up on the, the Harvard uh, Dataverse, which was excellent. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard for me to answer because I think the, the, the baseline assumption for most uh, empirical legal researchers right now is just to, this is, to, it sort of ends with this paper. I'll, I'll describe what I found, but I'm not gonna take any other efforts to make it available, which is not a great answer, but it's kind of the truth. Well, how, um, how I mean, how can that be influenced? I mean, how, how would you, how can we go about sort of making sure that law actually relies on transparent and reliable information from, you know, I guess, from, you know, from, from psychology or criminology or other empirical research areas? Yeah, this is something that I've been, been working on. Um, so because empirical legal research is sort of a, it's a strange field. Um, it's often conducted by folks who really just have a law degree. So um, in the States, someone with a JD or here with an LLB. Sometimes there are, there are quite a few of us who do have dual degrees in a more kind of quantitative or uh, at least a degree in which you would take some classes on research methods so to, to have, some, have some understanding. Uh, but we, we've been trying different, different approaches, talking to the law journals to try to get them to institute some sort of um, guidance or standards about, about publishing or about encouraging open data, open scripts, open materials. Uh, had a little bit of success, uh, but not a, not a whole lot. Um, the colleague of mine, uh, Kathy, is the, the chair of the Society for Empirical Legal Research. and um, She's working on, with their yearly conference, to have a requirement for some sort of openness, which might, which might help. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of an issue of social engineering <laughs> to some extent uh, with a group that 
is historically very confident in their, they're maybe overconfident in themselves and not that willing to scrutinize themselves or just really good at rational. Like I think lawyers are trained to rationalize things. So it's really hard to have an argument with them because they, they're, they're really good at it. I actually, I, I'm interested in that, that rationalization and perhaps, um, perhaps, you know, to an extent we all back rationalize the decisions that we make and try and find reasons for them after the fact. Um, but maybe thinking about it more uh, ahead of the fact, how, um, I guess we always have so many competing priorities, you know, time priorities, space priorities, um, you know, finan- you know, funding priorities. Um, so, and you know, it, with, with the projects that you've been involved with, um, how do you even decide on what projects you're going to focus on? Um, yeah, look, there's, there can be um, multiple sort of factors that are taken into consideration. Um, and sometimes they're just from like the small requests we get from students and from the community. Um, for example, with um, architecture students, so they might be sort of um, just gauging interest around different collections and what, what we're digitising in a small way might actually then build into let's just digitise the whole collection. Um, and that sort of happened probably a de- decade ago with um, the Pender Architectural Plans at Newcastle. Um, so that was the architecture students department. You know, it was, it was a good resource um, for, for that group. Um, similar was um, a project to digitise the Margaret Senior Natural History illustrations. So Margaret did those illustrations um, for the National uh, Parks and Wildlife Service back in the 60s and 70s and her archive came to the university. So again, that really suited the natural illustration course that we had at the university um, that sort of met the needs and was a fantastic resource for those students. Then other times the, um, the needs come out, like the donations um, that come to us often with a financial donation as well. So that can support digitization. Um, another one came out through a funding opportunity into our history fund, the Vera Deacon Regional History Fund, to do 20 oral histories um, relating to the Newcastle Cooperative Movement. Um, that uh, was established in the area back in the late 1800s. And it sort of complemented an existing archive that we had of those company original records. So, you know, it's sort of tying it to an existing archive um, and also just talking to academics and students to sort of see where other links can be made and um, that project, we sort of found that there was a link with the business and law school that they had um, a course that they developed around cooperative movements. So for them, you know, that was sort of an archive they didn't realise we had. We didn't actually realise that course was running. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a, a combination of things. But in Newcastle, we often um, have um, commemorations or uh, environmental protests and all sorts of movements that um, people all of a sudden seem to have like this interest in a particular archive or want to research a particular theme, industry, contamination issue that then sort of feeds into like student projects and um, often they're really difficult to sort of plan for because they'll just happen Um, and you know people all of a sudden realise that and a certain industry is celebrating, commemorating 100 years in a month's time. So those, it's a, it's a real combination of, um, yeah, funding opportunities, interests, um, and then linking where working with great learning students can sort of maybe work in this living lab model where they're able to sort of um, use resources and archives that then interpret and use them in like a meaningful way that sort of can make a difference to communities. Um. Yeah, Jason, I saw you had your uh, your digital hand raised. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, it's a bit of a, sorry, it's a bit of a backtrack, but I, I just thought of something, but, mm-hmm. um, which is that 
an interesting cross-cultural thing between maybe scientists or other researchers and, and lawyers, which is that if you actually look at legal submissions and law journal articles, they are very well cited. They are meticulous in their citing. Um, Tracy will know this, like almost every other sentence has a citation, but it's not, it's there to provide authority for what you're saying. And it's not really as concerned with providing um, a, a way that other people can reuse your analysis or take what you've done and, uh, and build on it. So it's, it's more about verification than it is about um, producing the literature people can actually stand on, on each other's shoulders. Oh, interesting. In yeah, it's a very different, a different way of thinking about it. Um, it's interesting how those, how different areas of um, uh, of the academic um, community, which you know from the outside already seems quite monolithic, uh, and yet it's incredibly diverse in its norms, just to, to how to approach even these basic concepts like citation within the literature and what it means to build up a, an academic corpus. Um, I actually want to kind of jump off from, from that again, Jason, um, because uh, I'm wondering if that affects um, kind of reproducibility or replicatability um, you know, across like empirical legal research in particular, but legal research, you know, uh, the legal system in general. Well, yeah, yeah, I think so. I kind of building on that, one of the most, and Tracy will be aware of this as well, one of the most common citations you'll see is, X is on file with the author. Um, so some report they're relying on, some transcript, something, uh, which is, um, again, I think it's there to say, hey, I have it. So you know, that, that's the authority. That's, that's why you should believe me. But um, a lot of times it will be very easy just to upload that somewhere uh, or find some other way to share it. Um, but if laws, like I haven't tested this, but if laws like most other fields, then either immediately or at least a few years down the line, you can't, it's really hard to get a hold of that person and they often don't share it. And I guess saying it's on file with the author doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're willing to share it. So it's, it's kind of unclear. Um, yeah, go ahead, Johnny. It, it's really important. I mean, the one wonderful, great advantage of the digital age is that we don't have to have a footnote on the page and then go and race trying to find it. You can actually have that digital footnote there. You know, when we're dealing with historical uh, uh, records, maps, plans, journals, whatever it is, um, when we compose these uh, posts, it's always wonderful to be able to link to the actual original. So people can ensure that what, how you've interpreted it is, is right, you know? To have I interpreted this correctly, you know? Um, and I think the readers of your interpretation need to be able to read it for themselves and say, yes, I agree, that's what it says, or no, I think you've com you completely misinterpreted it. And without that sort of second layer, you know, going back through your sources to see how you've it, come to your, your, your conclusions, um, I think that has to be transparent. That's why open access is really important. Um, it's wonderful being able to have a post to put your opinions about what you think about what happened and then also have the material behind it so people can actually see where your drawing is from. That's really crucial. Um, so, yeah, Jason, I would say that it's really important to have those sources there as well, uh, especially the more obscure ones where people are quoting uh, email conversations or, you know, unpublished manuscripts or things that might be a little obscure. Um, there's sorts of things that are really tantalizing, but you can find a place for them in a, in a, digital, um, in a digital world. Um, I mean, the real thing here is, and getting back to how Anne was talking about how we make our decisions as to what we put up there, um, we've got to get over the idea that everything is going to be digitized. You know, um, anyone that deals with data scientists understands there's a, a great, there's a, there's a silence around how much digital data we're producing and whether we can back all this up up. All right. Now our servers are full of cat and dog videos 
the law occupying, you know, uh, zettabytes, zotabytes, words I can't even make up in terms of, all I can say is that they've sort of, if you, if you put them onto DVD, ROMs or Blu-rays, they'll go from the sun to the planet Mars. And we're generating this amount of data every year, okay, as a human species. So we've got to get a bit more intelligent in terms of how we use the digital world. It's not a place to reproduce the natural world in. It's a place to communicate ideas that we need to know about that could be temporal, um, but it's a communication device. It's not a way to sort of replicate our physical world in while we destroy it in order to create a digital copy of it, you know, which is basically what's happening. The cloud is not a cloud up in the sky. It's a data farm somewhere where people have to clear forests in order to create these sorts of artificial things. And when, it, when one of these things burns down, as happened in, in France, I think was this year or last year, then data just disappears and no one's got a backup for it. So we've just, you know, think about why we're, you know, creating this stuff, why it has to be open access um, and make it compelling. So for us, it's we have these meetings every month with the local communities, with the local community groups, historical societies, historians, academics, students. We get them all into a room and we see what they're working on, you know, what they're doing. And um, we try to find collaborative collaborations that people can work on. So um, this year, for instance, there was, um, or last year, I think it was the, uh, they came with this Fortress Newcastle idea, you know, whereby during World War II, Newcastle and I think Sydney were the only two places in Australia that were heavily fortified with this complex um, system of, of, of um, military and training installations to protect these sites. And these were largely unknown stories. Um, so we started putting our resources into that, finding what material we could find. Um, we found filmmakers who were able to do that sort of work. We're working with a community group. Sam's got, you know, interns from the University of Sydney working on it. So it's it's you try and find what's going on as a networking thing, and then put your digital resources around it and make as much of that open access as possible, um, in order to make it work. Uh, there you go. That's my and, two again. <laughs> and I also think, yeah, the importance of open access um, is that, yeah, you're able to link information by having it out there openly. Um, we digitise glass, uh, the team digitised any collection of glass negatives probably about seven years ago and, um, you know, photographs, there weren't, wasn't information written on the back of them because they were glass and, you know, our conservators spent time conserving them. We digitised having an exhibition, but put them online as well. So the information we were able to get back from the community, you know, they otherwise they would have sat on the probably another de couple of decades. Um, but the links um, that we we got from, there, were, there was a selection of that um, collection, didn't seem to fit. The photographs were quite different. Um, they were the Pacific River up in New Guinea. Um, so the gentleman that took these, um, Thomas Radoni, he was um, part of the war effort and the first um, fighting that took place was in New Guinea. And when we put them online, we found that these there was um, a few of the photographs that were part of um, an ethnologist, German ethnologist, um, Richard Thurmworld. Um, and, you know, because the camp had been looted, they were then brought back to Newcastle by this gentleman you know, this is 100 years ago, but, you know, if we hadn't have made that open, openly available for people to sort of find, we wouldn't have connected these photographs to the community of ethnologists. In Germany, there was um, a researcher from the University of South Australia, you know, they got really excited because they were missing images that were part of this collection. So it, it just shows you like Johnny said, we don't digitise everything, but, you know, it's the connections that can be made and sometimes yeah. straight away, they could be six months, 12 months down the track, but yeah. it's almost like serendipity, the, the things yeah. that happen. There um, were four very lonely boxes sitting in the bottom of this house in Belmont and after they went up online, they were connected to Papua New Guinea, you know, um, the National War Memorial, um, 
Berlin. I mean, there was all these strands of connections which came out of that story. I remember the night that we got that email from that uh, professor in South Australia, I felt very embarrassed because I thought, oh my God, you know, <laughs> half of these, some of these uh, negs were actually looted by the Australian forces in Papua New Guinea, looting an anthropologist's hut. You know, they stole everything, you know. And that anthropologist, because he was a scientist, went down and complained to the Australian, you know, uh, generals there and said, look, you know, I've got nothing to do with this war. I'm a scientist. I'm something. I want my negs back. And, you know, 100 years later, part, some of these negs are there. That story, impossible, as Anne said, to be told unless we put it out there. So sometimes there's more to this, this story about our histories that come out once we share it. The more open access we make things, the more eyes we have looking at this thing, um, the greater the knowledge that we gain from this stuff. And it's, it's the best policy with regards to the preservation of our knowledge. Okay, if we have a look at the history of what has survived, the collapse, the rise and fall of civilizations. Really, all that we've got now is basically the Bible's sort of made it through and also the complete works of Plato. And the reason why those two things made it through was because people shared, copied and shared them. That's basically it. And um, we can get quite upset with piracy. We can get quite upset with people who just, you know, make things available illegally, um, <laughs> But generally, they're on the right side of history. The people, if you have a look at medieval texts, medieval texts were plagiarised gigantic big wads of texts from earlier texts. It's lucky that we have those plagiarised things or else we wouldn't have the early texts that they came from either. You know, So largely, a lot of copying and sharing is actually a good thing from the preservation of human knowledge. I mean, that's speaking from an archivist point of view. Um, so be careful with all the legal things that we go on with about protecting people's copyrights. We can do that. But the more we isolate stuff and put it behind walls, the more vulnerable we make it that it won't be saved. You know, with audiovisual material, for instance, um, we don't have a life raft. The only life raft we've got for audiovisual material is the digital world. And if we don't get it out there and copied and shared, um, then it's very vulnerable that it will survive. So whenever I see people downloading stuff, we encourage it. Please take as many photographs as you like. Talk to anyone that's been involved in those little uh, community uh, historical societies that burned down in the bushfires um, and see how many of them are having their collections put back together again from the tourists that went in there and took photographs of them. You know, And these are the sorts of things I'm talking about. Once that stuff goes, um, without some kind of digital digital copy, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's curtains. I think that that's a, a really interesting point that we often underappreciate in the, in the open access discussion. You know, we're, we're used to it just being a given that the material will at least survive, even if it's behind paywalls or hidden in an archive somewhere or, you know, kept safe, that it'll at least survive. Um, but yeah, you make a really good point that, you know, part of um, making copies and sharing and reusing this material means that it lowers the risk of it genuinely becoming, you know, completely disappeared. I mean, I, I knew someone who did some amazing work in 3D digital scans of, um, uh, of both buildings and statues in Syria before the Syrian civil war. And those scans are the only, you know, um, detailed records remaining of a lot of these objects now. Um, I'm actually jumping back over to, to, to Jason. Are, are there any cases that you know of, of uh, either decisions or materials disappearing or the, um, that kind of chain of citations leading back to something that's not possible to verify in the, uh, originally? Or are those records generally kind of quite stable and safe? Um, nothing's really, so the, the only relevant thing that I can, so, so I don't really know much about copyright law and, um, I can't come up with an example off the top of my head of what you're asking. Um, but you know, I've, I've definitely pushed the boundaries on these things in the past where, um, like I've, um, did pay for a lot of transcripts, which I don't have the copyright for. I think in some jurisdictions, the, the 
private company that actually owns it. Um, and where it's been very clear, if you read the transcript, that some, some expert witnesses have been saying things that are scientifically invalid. And I think it's really important to get that out there. But um, all I was legally able to do is quote it. So I, or, you know, quote experts of it. So, you know, I did upload it to the open science framework and no one's, no one's, no one's got me yet, but uh, it's a real, it's a real challenge. No one, please don't tell anybody about this, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that uh, has kind of come out of this is how, um, how varied the experiences in different areas can be. Um, and so one of the things, Jason, I saw that you've worked on is registered reports in, in forensic science, which is an idea that I know mostly from, from clinical trials. Um, is, that, is that where you came across the concept of registered reports? Um, and, so, and I guess, yeah, a summary of registered reports for, for those who come from areas where they're not common. Oh, yes. Um, so I think that's been, that's been one of, there's some, uh, some talk of, the development of kind of a new interdisciplinary field of like meta meta research or open science. It's not really new because it does not, not uh, uh, sorry, I mean, meta science. It's not really new because it really just kind of builds on fields that have been doing this for a long time, like science and technology studies and scientometrics. Uh, but yeah, I think where the, the idea for that came from was the, the fact that this field is very interdisciplinary and it was largely social scientists borrowing this idea of registration from uh, clinical medical research, which has been doing it for longer. The, the, the general idea is pretty obvious actually, is that you um, have your, your research plan, your protocol, and you put it somewhere such that it's um, either open access initially or embargoed for a while, typically on a, a clinical trial registry. And then people can, first of all, see ideally if someone's doing this research so they don't uh, duplicate efforts, but also see if you changed your protocol after you saw the data or after some data started coming in. Um, and the idea of registered reports builds on that where it's, and also I think systematic reviews, this is pretty common, um, will, it, it's, it's that protocol that's peer reviewed before data is collected so that there really is no incentive to massage the data or the analysis at all because your protocol has been been accepted, so it doesn't really matter what your data look like, which is the best way for science to work, I think, because it decreases that incentive to behave badly. Um, but yeah, I think I, <laughs> it'd be perfect for, for forensic science because we want uh, the, the body of research to not be affected by the incentives of the forensic scientists, which I think are largely to show that their techniques work really well. So it'd be so it's, it's, it seems like a no brainer to me, but, um, and we got one journal to start accepting it with, with me as the editor, but um, we haven't had any submissions yet. <laughs> so uh, actually interesting, I, I kind of linking that uh, drawing ideas from different research fields, like that kind of cross field collaboration. Um, there's a question that came up in the chat about um, kind of international or global collaboration. So a, a question to, to Anne and Gianni is, um, so is there any global collaboration currently for digitization and preservation of indigenous data or records or um, uh, sounds, art stories, like those other types of um, uh, records around the world? Not that, not that I'm aware of, I mean, um... From our point of view, I mean, our, our closest collaboration that we've done in terms of pushing this right into areas that um, are new for us um, would be the Deep Time Project. Now, in Newcastle West, for those who don't know, um, there was a 6,500-year-old Aboriginal factory site, tool-making site, uh, uncovered, and um, they've put a fast food restaurant over the top of it. So we had a sample of um, the traditional owner groups that worked on the site decided to um, uh, place the artifacts that were discovered there in a test trench uh, with us. Now, years later, we, we wondered what we were going to do with this because people couldn't visit the site anymore. Um, this site recorded three ways of human occupation 
across the six and a half thousand years. We had the artifacts and working with the innovation team, we were able to, to do some really wonderful things, which is scan the artifacts, put them into a digital platform. And then these wonderful people were able to recreate the dig in three dimensions. They did this pilot in 12 weeks. Um, now the archeologists loved it. Um, it resonated with similar sort of time machine ideas that were being done, let's say the city of Venice, they were doing theirs across um, 17,000 years. Uh, the city of New York that was doing another one, um, don't know how far back that one went, um, but potentially they're the sorts of projects that we could, we could work in with. I mean, the scanners that we were using were very similar to the scanners that um, the teams at Herculaneum in Italy were scanning their carbonized scrolls the libraries so they were doing carbonized scrolls that were discovered in the epicurean library in herculaneum we were using the same scanner to do aboriginal artifacts um, on that side now the problem that we've got here is this technology given australia's background with aboriginal people and the problems that we've still got to deal with i mean we're at just taking baby steps at the moment we don't all force people into anything. We bring, we're still in the phase where we're just inviting groups in to show them what's possible with the technology and let them sit with it, you know, have a think about it. Is this something that you feel that you're comfortable with? You know, we don't want to push anybody into it. Collaborations like that, um, Thomas, I think come after we've sort of got our own backyard in order, you know, before we start dealing, you know, across across countries. I think Australia's got so much work to do. It's wonderful that we're all introducing ourselves and the Aboriginal countries are coming from, but it's really just baby steps at the moment trying to, to get ourselves uh, ready. And from our point of view, we'd like to experiment with these technologies, show people what's possible and invite those wonderful collaborations because I think it'll be fantastic um, at some point. And another, another collection, I know Johnny knows a lot it's the climate records um, of the region. And so I know Scott mentioned the citizen historian, um, the sort of scholarship can go on in communities um, that are familiar with science records and these climate records are being digitised and um, metadata created. And that is more on a global scale. I know Johnny's been part of the international um, article sort of highlighting the links to similar records. Um, yeah, we, we got Australia an extra dot. It only had three dots <laughs> before. This is where global scientists make the climate models on. So we got them an extra dot. Uh, we might get another one soon. So, but you know, that's, that's what's sitting in, in people's pastoral archives. Yeah. And, and so they've already been created, you know, people of the past, they've done the work. They've created all this data. It's there now for it to be used. And, um, yeah, so there's some really um, exciting sort of stuff happening in that area of, um, you know, scientists using that material um, to foresee, you know, the changes that are going to happen over the next 100 years. So I want to, um, before we do a final wrap up, I want a, a short answer from, from each person on the question of um, uh, what's the, what problem is there that outside your own discipline, people from other disciplines might not realise um, and might be a, a way of guiding people to think of their own, uh, think about their own work? Well, I, I, you don't mind if I go first, Thomas? Yeah, go for it. I, I had to really stop and think, what discipline am I from? Like, I, I think um, I'm a former social worker. I've worked in heritage conservation. Um, I'm a trained historian. I think my social work background and working with allied health and in that team, like multidisciplinary teams, still sort of work in that sort of culture. Um, and so in the library, I've, yeah, I felt that, you know, um, I really like collaborating, sharing, hearing, uh, just working with students from other disciplines. So if anything, um, you know, how we can sort of break down these silos and, and you know, collaborate a little bit more, um, it's just, yeah, maybe people sort of in, in 
um, other disciplines where they might might find it hard to find those opportunities is um, is just really look hard, make an effort, <laughs> um, and and just any opportunity that comes up, you know, you'd be surprised what might come out of it of um, being able to sort of work with others from from different disciplines. <laughs> yeah, same. I, I just tend to think uh, archivists, if that's what I mean, um, very shy lot. Um, I think we need to, um, well, I think it's, it's very important what Anne said. I think it's very important for us to form uh, multidisciplinary teams around anything that we do um, and try to find people. I mean, I love to work with um, innovative um software developers, anyone that can help me get um, this digital content into a new canvas. Um, um, and so to do that, you really need to not just be working with fellow archivists or historians, but people from different skill sets and different perspectives. I, I've kind of mentioned this a bit already, um, or certainly this theme, but uh, maybe a lot of people, a lot of people aren't aware, maybe, uh, you know, I could be wrong about this, but I do think a lot of the transparency in law is more performative than actual, actually transparent. So, you know, we have like royal commissions as we, we've talked about and, and um, uh, like law reform processes, which are kind of great, are good in that they publish their reports and they'll often hold webinars that are open to the public. But I think so much goes on behind the scenes that we just don't know about. Like, how are the experts for the roundtables selected? And um, sure, they, they get all this evidence, but then they have wide discretion about how much weight to put on each, on each, on each source of evidence, um, which is very little, you know, very little transparency around. Fantastic. I, I've found this discussion really interesting. So thank you all for um, participating in it. It's been uh, an excellent, um, uh, an excellent way to spend a, uh, a Wednesday early afternoon for me. Um, I'll just hand over now uh, to Angie to do the final wrap up. I better unmute myself because I can't say thank you without you hearing me. So thank you, everyone. That was a really great session. Really interesting to hear about all those different areas. Um, this afternoon, we do have our next OA session on um, how to address global challenges with open science. I know we touched on that a little bit here. Um, so we can further that discussion this afternoon. I've popped the um, registration for the event in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone.